Ah, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like what the Apostle Paul said. I think myself happy. I don't know about you, but I think I'm happy. I'm so happy. Hallelujah. What an awesome God that we serve. That old song, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Come on, his eyes on the sparrow. He's watching over every single person in this room. God sees you. God knows you. God loves you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate a church that prays throughout the week. I appreciate a church that evangelizes throughout the week. I appreciate a church that comes here early before service to pray. I thank God for a church that we worship the Lord. We're not here putting giftings and talents on display, but we are here singing as unto the Lord. If this setting was anywhere else, if someone at all thinks that everything we've done here is absolutely absurd and crazy, if you were to change the setting and it be an arena, whether it be some sort of band or whether it be some sort of athletic team, you would not think it strange at all. But we're just more in love and more excited and more expressive about Jesus than any other athletic figure, any other person that is out there, any other entity that is out there. I don't want anything in my life to sing higher praise to something that is not God. Jesus is God, and I will most gladly express the way I feel about him. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And verse 4, hallelujah. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Now, who's going to say to that king, what are you doing? Now, we have no problem challenging authority. Because of the society, the culture in which we live. But where the word of a king is, there is a king is not a president. A king is not part of a parliament where you know you get to you know elect them to, into office and bring them in. King is the king. He is sovereign. He is in control. There is none to challenge. Obviously, we live in a different world today. But where the word of a king is, there is power. And who's going to say to that king, what doest thou? I want to preach for the next couple moments here about the word of a king. Can you pray that God would help us to receive his word today? I love you, Jesus. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you, God, for what we feel in this room today. It is your spirit, it is your presence, and we are thankful for it. I pray in Jesus' name that your kingdom will come and that your will would be done here in the next few moments. I pray you open up our ears to hear your word. In any and every spirit, any and every attitude, Lord, any element in the room that would be contrary to your spirit, I pray, God, that you would overcome it and overtake it. Let it be like a wave of your glory that sweeps in like a flood. And no matter how strong the resistance, God, I pray it cannot fight against your glory. Let your glory, Lord, raise everything in this room. Let everything be swept away by your glory. Let your presence, let your flood, let your holiness fill this atmosphere. I love you, Jesus. I give you praise. I love you, Jesus. I give you honor. I magnify your name. I pray your will be done in the next few moments. And everyone say in Jesus' name, amen. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. We read this discourse, Jesus comes to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He's speaking with his disciples. He poses this question, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Who am I? And they reply, some believe, Jesus, that you are John the Baptist. Some believe you are Elias. 
Some believe Jeremiah or one of the prophets. There were a lot of rumors going around concerning the identity of Jesus. It was circulating across the then known globe about miracles, signs, and wonders. Blinded eyes open, deaf ears open, the lame leaping, the dead coming back to life. And all these reports circulating and everybody had their editorial page and their opinion about Jesus and some believe that he was John the Baptist, and some believe that he was Elias, some believe that he was Jeremiah. But Jesus said, I want to know who you say that I am in verse 15. Jesus wanted to know which, which news feed are you reading, and which news feed has influenced your decision making, and what is the conclusion of everything you have read? What is the conclusion? of everything that you have heard, everything that you have uh, been exposed to, what report do you believe? Simon speaks up. He says, you are the Christ. That means you are the Messiah. He goes on to say, you are the son of the living God, meaning you are the incarnation, the manifestation, the physical appearance of the living God. You are the express image of the invisible God. You are Jesus. You are the Christ. You are the living God. Jesus responds to this bold declaration, and he says, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose or release on earth will be loosed or released in heaven. Peter's declaration may seem like a wild guess, maybe a reckless act of faith, but Jesus ultimately reveals to him the source of his declaration. He said, it is a revelation what you have declared. It is a revelation what you have decreed. The report in which you say it is not fake news, it is not misinformation. What you are saying is absolutely true, and it is a revelation. Inside of all of us in this room, there should be a desire. Whatever you have heard about God, whatever report you have heard about Him and His nature, whatever you have heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to be asking that you would get a revelation about His identity. And this identity of who Jesus is, is a revelation. And because of this revelation... He says that you are now having unlocked to you. You are having given to you this gift of demonstration. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. There are many reports of who Jesus is. I don't have this scripture up right now, but it just literally came to my mind a second ago. I preached it uh, uh, maybe a couple weeks ago in one of the next town, I think it was Millbank. But there's a story of a queen of Sheba who is on a journey. She hears about Solomon, and all these reports about Solomon seem over the top. It seems absolutely crazy. It must be exaggeration. It must be just colorful language. Nobody can be that wealthy, and nobody can be that wise. But when the queen of Sheba arrives onto the scene of Solomon's kingdom, her eyes are open and she is marveled as she behind her has an entourage of gifts. One, it was custom to bring gifts unto another dignitary, but it also, I believe, was her trying to express, I got wealth too. I got power as well. I got influence. And maybe perhaps hers would impress the king because what she has is greater than what he has. But it only took a few steps into Solomon's kingdom. It only took a few glances around to see what 
that those serving in that kingdom were wearing, to see what they were wearing, to see how they carried themselves and how they presented themselves. And she began to talk to Solomon. The Bible says he, he began to share everything that she was opening up about concerning in her heart, in her motion. He could read her mail. And when it was all said and done, the Bible says there was no more spirit in her. There was no more breath in her. Her breath was literally taken away. And she said, I, I've heard the reports. I've heard about your power, your influence, your kingdom, your riches, your wisdom. But I just, I got to be honest with you. I did not believe what I heard until I came onto the scene. Until my foot stepped into this realm did I fully see that I was at fault in what I said. It all is true and then some. And the best way I can say it, the Queen of Sheba said, is the half has not been told. They, they could try to expound on the greatness of your wisdom. They can try to disclose all of your wealth, your majesty, and your influence. But every report I heard, it's not even half as a great of a king that you are. I want you to know that in this room, there is a greater than Solomon. His name is Jesus. And whatever you've heard about Jesus, whatever you've read in your Bible about Jesus, yes, he has opened up blinded eyes. Yes, he has unlocked deaf ears. Yes, he has called the dead back to life. But the half has not even been told, for eye hasn't seen and ear has not not even heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Is there anyone here that loves Jesus? If you love Jesus, he has already prepared some things for you that you have not seen. He's already prepared some things for you that you've not heard. He's already prepared some things for you that you can experience. Hallelujah. The half has not been told about how great our God is. But what report have you heard about Jesus? And what do you believe about him is important? I believe it's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. My Jesus is not diminishing in power. He is not diminishing in authority. He is not growing weak. He is not growing weary. He is an eternal, immortal, invisible, only wise God. And the same Jesus I read about in the Bible, I do not believe in the 21st century that we're going to see less of his power and less of his glory and less of his willingness to save a lost soul. There are a lot of reports circulating about who Jesus is. There's reports that circulate about what this church is and what this church believes. You know, some people think we're crazy. Some people think we're heretics. Some people think we're a cult. I tell them we're not a cult. Nobody does anything we tell them to do. And so there's no way we could be a cult. And so all of a sudden here, there's all these reports and these rumors about Jesus. We read this prophecy in Isaiah 53 in verse 1. It says, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I ask you today, whose report do you believe? There's an old song back in the day growing up I would hear, whose report do you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Who does God reveal his arm to? God reveals his arm to those who believe his report. Verse 2, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is a prophecy about Jesus, this Messiah, who Peter correctly identified that he is the Christ. He is the Savior, the anointed one. So we read about this prophecy concerning the Christ. It says, as he grows up, he will be like a tender plant. He will be like a root out of a dry ground. No form nor comeliness. I find it interesting as he's using agriculture to expound on who the identity of the Messiah is. That he would be frail and he would come up from the most unlikely place. An unfruitful ground. One that is dry. One that is not well watered. One that is not desirable. I believe God is attracted to dry ground. I believe God is attracted to that which you don't believe a harvest can come. That's why we're 
we're going to see harvest. That's why we're going to see regional revival. For there are many reports about the North Country. There's many reports about South Dakota that it's a dry ground in a dry land. But I believe that we're in good standing with the Lord Jesus Christ because like a root out of a dry ground. No form nor comeliness when we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. And so this Messiah walking on this earth, the Bible says he will not look attractive. There is nothing desirable about his face. It doesn't look good. It goes on to say in verse 3, he's despised, rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. It does not sound like a great description for a Messiah to save the world. There's nothing attractive about him. He is frail. He is fragile. He's not even liked. He is rejected. He is filled with sorrow. He's very acquainted or accustomed with grief. He's despised, and we don't even regard him of much value. This is the prophecy about Jesus Christ. Verse 4, but surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. By all appearances, Jesus looked the opposite of his objective. He looked nothing like a Messiah. He looked nothing like a deliverer. He looked nothing like a way maker. He looked nothing like a provider. He looked nothing like an influencer. He looked nothing like someone that people would follow, that people would be drawn to. He was the antithesis of all fleshly desires. For we don't want to be people of sorrow. We don't want to be acquainted with grief. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be ugly. We don't want to be despised. We don't want to live on a dry ground. But here, the Messiah, Jesus, fills all of those descriptions. But the clarity of all that he is going through says in verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, all of a sudden, we see the opposite of Jesus. We see the things that we would like. We would like a clear slate. We would like the absence of sin. We would like peace in our life, and we would like healing. But Jesus came in the form and took on the form of everything that appeared opposite to what you desire. You would desire blessing. You would desire breakthrough. You would desire healing. You would desire liberty. You would desire joy. You would desire all these things. But our Messiah looked like none of those things. And so verse 6, it says, all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We didn't like the way of the Messiah. We didn't like the way that Jesus took, that path that he took. So people turned away from Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter 6, on the day of hard sayings, many went away from him. Some estimate that was his largest gathering, and it was also his largest departure from him. In one day, he had the largest following, and in one day, it was all walking away other than just a small core and a small group. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. People turn to their own way. What would be the reward that this Messiah would give to somebody that rejects him? What would be the response of this Messiah, this Christ, the anointed one, when people would despise him, when people would reject him, when people would walk away from him, when people would esteem him stricken, afflicted of God. People esteemed and said, my conclusion of observing this Jesus is that he is God forsaken. My conclusion of this Jesus, this ministry that I am observing, is that he is being punished. He is 
is not a good person. But the Bible says that the reward of this Messiah, the reward of the Lord, and this response to all of this rejection was to lay on him the iniquity of us all. This is mind-boggling. If you would consider the times somebody ticked you off, if you would consider the times somebody betrayed you, if you would consider your emotional reaction when somebody backstabbed you, when somebody offended you, when somebody upset you, when somebody evoked all this emotion inside of you, I promise you this, whatever offense you are gone, have gone through or going through, it pales in comparison to what the Lord Jesus Christ has gone through. He is very very well acquainted with grief. He is a man of sorrows. He came to his own and his own received him not. And his response is, I will lay on me all of your sin and all of your iniquity. What manner of love is this that the one creator of heaven and earth and all mankind would come to his own and his own would reject him. And he said, I'm still going to put your sin on my back. I'm still going to put your sin in the palm of my hand. I I'm still willing to die for you and save you from your sin. If you're thankful, would you clap your hands? There were many prophecies about the Messiah. There was many reports about him, what he would be like. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.14, Thou Keep his commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Whatever your philosophy or theology about Jesus, I want you to know there's only one King of kings. There is only one Lord of lords. There is only one God and he will reveal and let all mankind see that Jesus Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In Matthew 7, 28 and 9, it comes to pass when Jesus is coming to the conclusion of his teaching on the Sermon of the Mount, the people are astonished at his doctrine because the Bible says he teaches as one that has authority. Not like all of the other religious and philosophical people out there. Because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. When Jesus spoke, he was more than a man. He was more than a philosopher. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so when Jesus spoke where the word of a king is, there is power. Jesus' words are greater than whatever favorite political speech you have ever heard in your life. Whatever historical figure that you fancy. Whatever poetry that you fancy. I rest assured and know this. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Words have power. Words have influence. But where the word of a king is, it is matchless power. There is no greater word than the word of the king of kings. Jesus, when he taught, there was authority in his voice. You keep reading him after this sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 8. He heals someone in verses 1 through 4, and then you see the next healing that takes place that Jesus is approached by a centurion, and the centurion says, my, my servant is home, sick of the palsy, and he's tormented. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. It's interesting, the person before says, if you, if you will, you can. And Jesus says, 
I can, I will. This man doesn't even have to ask what the will is. He just says, I will come and heal him. But the response of the centurion is so amazing. He says, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof, but if you would speak the word only, my servant shall be healed. Because I'm a man under authority, and I understand how authority works. And what I've heard about you, Jesus, all the reports that came to my table, all the reports that I heard with my ear, and standing here with you, I recognize this. You are one of authority. And where there is authority, and that word goes forth out of that authoritative figure, there is power behind those words. Jesus says, I am marveled. I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Jesus is blown away. Jesus is impressed and amazed that somebody has the revelation of the power of the word of someone in authority. He saw that Jesus has all power and authority. And all I need Jesus to do is speak the word. And if Jesus would speak the word, every Everything that's going on back home, it can change 100%. Because where the word of a king is, there is power. Matthew 8, 16 and 17, the night is coming. And they're bringing to Jesus many people possessed with devils. Oh my goodness, devils. Oh my goodness, darkness, stronghold, strong man's prince of the power of the air. Here comes all this ugly, fuddy duddy coming up against Jesus. And the Bible says he cast them out with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled by the very prophecy we just read that was stated in Isaiah himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. I, I don't have a very deep thought whatsoever. It's more at the shallow end of the pool. But if you can simply get revelation of who Jesus is and what his word means and the power that it carries, it can change everything in your life. People are always trying to find the next big this, the next big that, the next deep doctrine. But there is no other doctrine. There is no other faith than that which was once the delivered. We're not here to preach a different Jesus. We're here to preach the same Jesus. We're not here to preach a different doctrine. We're here to preach the same doctrine. That these signs shall follow them that believe. I believe who Jesus is. And I believe he's still a healer. Oh, someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where the word of a king is. There is power. The devil wants to try to create as much space between you and the word as possible. If he can increase the distance between you and the word, he can influence and diminish the faith in which you have. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And how can we hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? The next thing that the devil does besides create distance between us and the word is to create a misinterpretation between us and the word. There is no private interpretation of any prophecy of scripture. God's said what he meant and God meant what he said. This is not an open karaoke book where we can just kind of all put our own twist on it. There is a forever settled word of God and the enemy knows the power of the word. The enemy has power. The enemy has authority. The enemy has influence. But he is no match for the word. I said the devil is no match for the word. And so if you are a wordless Christian, you are a defenseless Christian. 
If you are a wordless believer, you are a vulnerable believer. But if you can get more of God's word in your heart, no weapon formed against you can prosper. And no false preacher preaching false doctrine can lead you astray. Because there are many winds of doctrine blowing across these prairies. But man, the people that got the word, they got an anchor. They got a foundation. And no matter what kind of wind of false doctrine or tradition comes, the church will still remain earnestly contending for the faith. Someone say hallelujah. 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 And the greater the distance between a word and a person can cause doubt upon the word that was spoken. Over 400 years between the prophecy of Isaiah and the life and times of Jesus Christ. But that word was just as true five, four to 500 years later as it was four to 500 years prior. When God speaks it, it is forever settled. It is written. It was spoken. It was decreed. It is in the annals of eternity. And the Bible says that when this Messiah comes forth, no matter the amount of rejection, there is still healing in him. He may look like the opposite of all the interpretations and all the reports, but he's going to come back with a witness to show that the word is true. And this Jesus that walked 30, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, he was able to heal the sick because the word declared with his stripes you are healed. This suffering Messiah, this peasant in appearance, this homeless wandering man. He may not look like much, but there's one thing that we must know. He was king, and because he's the king, his word has power. And so when he would come against every dark, demonic spirit, he would speak the word, and those devils had to give way. You got to get the word back into your prayer life. You must learn to pray the word on a daily basis because we may fumble over our words and we may not know what to say but if I can pray the promises of God if I can quote the scripture in my prayer time if I can quote the scripture in my car that doesn't matter what emotion comes over me and what weapon is formed against me because where the word of a king is there is power A devil in this area, he likes to intimidate people. He likes to do all the talking. He likes your thoughts to be louder than the word. He likes your emotions to be louder than the word. He wants your feelings to be magnified above the word. But we must magnify the word above all. We just sang about the name. The Bible says in Psalm 138 verse 2, God has magnified his word above his name. And so if we can magnify the word above our name, I, and forget my reputation, forget my feelings, Forget my background for just a moment. Let me magnify God's word above my name. If the name of Jesus is the greatest name and the word is magnified above that name, I think we would do well to speak his name more than any devil's name, more than any other spirit's name. I, I believe in spiritual warfare. I, I, I live it. I preach it. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm walking in that kind of realm. I face, face those kinds of things. But I refuse to talk about the spirit of this area more than the spirit of the living God. I refuse to focus on my feelings more than the word of God. I refuse to focus on hell more than the word of God. I will magnify his word. Because where the word of a king is, there is power. 
I, I was I was just uh, the other week. I can't remember times all uh, uh, a wreck right now in my mind. But I, I was at a, uh, a a gathering of ministers at at Bishop Mark Morgan's retreat there in Nevada City, California. And he, there was a lot of good nuggets they threw out there. But one thing he said that caught my attention. He said, "You know, Moses, when he returned to Egypt, Moses stepped into Pharaoh's court." But when Moses said, thus saith the Lord, Pharaoh was now in God's court. That's what you have to understand when you are praying and declaring the word of God. You might step into South Dakota. You might step into your neighborhood. You might step into a certain region. And you might be walking where Pharaoh is at. But the moment you say, thus saith the Lord, that strong man is now in the courts of the word of God. And where the word of the God is, there is power. Mm. Man, I don't know what to do with y'all right now. The king is in the house. Jesus is king of kings and lord of that centurion, that man could have brought his ego. He could have brought his degree. He could have brought his influence. He could have brought his talent. He could have brought his ability. He could have brought his expertise. But instead he said, I'm not worthy, but I can recognize authority. And where the word of a king is, there is power. And you are greater than the prince of the power of the air. You are greater than the strong man. You are greater than the opposition. The only reason why we talk about spiritual warfare, the only reason why we talk about spirits of this area, the only reason why we do that is to help you identify your enemy. Not to magnify your enemy. Don't get it backwards. We do not magnify the devil. We identify him, we expose him, and we expel him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My king is greater than the prince of the power of the air. Can we lift our hands for just a moment? I'm just about done. I only got a couple more minutes. Would you lift your voice and would you call on the name of Jesus for a moment? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, I love you. Hallelujah, Jesus, I praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you. I love your word. Jesus, I love your word. What are you up against? What are you fighting right now? What seems to have leverage over you? What is the prevailing feeling that is contrary to the peace of God? What is your contrary emotion to the joy of the Lord? Identify it. Then magnify the word above it. Magnify the word above it. They brought many demons before Jesus, and he didn't panic. He cast them out with his word. Whatever stronghold, if it's like the heavens are like bronze above your head, if you feel imprisoned with bars of iron and titanium, Jeremiah 23 and 29, is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Whatever you're hitting your head against, bring the word against it. Begin to declare the word over the resistance. I said it in the last service in Webster. Don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big your God is. Just recite the word of God 
over that which opposes God. I can promise you this. At some point, the fire is going to burn it or the hammer is going to break it. I don't know how God's word unfolds it, but all I know is it will not stand before you forever because only God's word is forever. I said only God's word is forever. That resistance is not forever settled. God's word is forever settled in heaven. Someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick, it's alive. It is powerful because where the word of a king is, there is power. God's word. Wherever you can quote God's word, wherever you can pray God's word, wherever you can write God's word, wherever you can read God's word, wherever you can listen to God's word, there is power and there is life. You don't know what you're up against? Get the word involved. Look, it divides the sun of the soul and the spirit, the joints of the marrow, the center of thoughts and intents of the heart. So fine of a scalpel uh, is scalpel is the word of God that it's thin enough and precise enough to create division between what you're thinking and what you're feeling. To let you know, is it in your mind or is it in your heart? So clear and precise. is It's not just some big battle axe that just you carelessly swing around though it has that power it is a finely tuned instrument that can get right to your soul and spirit and let you know is this a spiritual issue is this an emotional issue is this a heart issue is this a mental issue but no matter the issue it's no match for the word it's no match for the word Whew. Because where the word of the king is, there is power. Yeah. Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them. Are you here today? Is there ailments in your body? Is there sickness in your body? Are you fighting cancer? Are you fighting some sort of arthritic condition? Are you fighting some sort of blood disease? Are you fighting some sort of mental disease? I don't diminish your issue, but I magnify the word here today. Are you fighting some sort of sexual addiction? Are you fighting some sort of anger, wrath, or rage? I don't diminish what you're going through, but I will magnify the word above what you're going through. Because if you can elevate the word above what you're going through, the word Word will prevail for where the word of a king is there is power the Bible says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction God will deliver you from self-destruction if you can get in the word and the of Proverbs 28 I'm just about done chapter 20 and verse 8 the king that sits in the throne of judgment scatters away all the evil with his eyes See, a king that has power and authority, especially a holy king, a pure king, a godly king. See, evil likes to use intimidation tactics and fear tactics where you feel overwhelmed by what's against you. But what you need to do is bring what's against you before the throne. And once you put evil in the throne room of the Lord Jesus Christ, that look of that king scatters all evil. Oh, you know, some parents, they have to scream ever-loving mad to get their kids to do what they want. Now, there's a point you scream if they're not listening. But if, if there is a clear understanding of who is the authority parent can just give a look. Anyone ever have a parent that gave you the look? You, you were running and you were having fun. You were, you were having the time of your life and all of a sudden you caught glance of mama. Because where the word of a queen is, <laughs> there's a spoon. <laughs> Old school. Huh? 
Yeah, that's exactly what our God is. When that, when that devil was all, it was his shoreline, it was his place. But when Jesus stepped on shore, everything changed when the word that was made flesh was there. And all of a sudden, they, they began to try to make a deal and make a plea. Please, 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 please. Because where the word of a king is, there is power. And Proverbs 16, 15 says, in the light of the king's countenance is life. It says it like this in the New Living Translation. When the king smiles, there is life. In 1530, it says the light of the eyes rejoices the heart. Or in New Living, it says a cheerful look brings joy to the heart. See, what you need to get a revelation of is to correctly see how the king sees you. You're scared of the king. You're scared of him. You're afraid of him. But if you know that you are his kid and he looks at you with a smile, he looks at you with favor, it does something for you. Man, when there's a healthy dynamic between a father and son, that son loves to see their father. I don't want, I don't want to step on the scene and my kids resent that I'm home. I don't want to step on the scene as a parent or as a pastor or as any type of leadership role. And the moment you step in, everybody just is uncomfortable and wants out of there. I want to be the type of person that when I step in, that all of a sudden there's a cheer. You got to see your heavenly father is that. That when I come into his presence, when he's on that throne and he looks at me, it gets me excited. I'm happy to see Jesus. I'm happy to talk to him. I got his favor. I got his blessing. I got his love. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? Would you call on the name of Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Come on, that's it. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your disease, who redeems your life from destruction. The word of God is true. Whatever the distance between you and your prophecy, whatever the distance between you and your promise, it is reducing. The promise is coming closer. The fulfillment is coming closer. The time of God's word is drawing nigh. And you should get more frequent with the word to encourage your faith. Because wherever there's the word, there's power. And it will come to pass. For it says in Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on you. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. My thoughts are not your thoughts, your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's just like the rain that comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You will go out with joy. You will be led forth with peace. The mountains, the hills will break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree it shall be to the lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off god's word will accomplish what it set out to do so much so that after 400 years, Peter 
quotes that same word that we read in Isaiah 53. As he talked about Jesus in 1 Peter 2.24. He bare our sins in his own body on that tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye were healed. You were as sheep going astray. But now you've returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Let's stand together. The word of the king is here. We have read the word. We have quoted the word. We have spoken the word. We have declared the word. There is power. There is power in this room. If you need healing in your body, God will heal you today. If you need deliverance from substance abuse, God will deliver you today. I'm persuaded of it. It's not my word. It's not my promise. It's God's promise. Peter got the revelation of who Jesus is. And with that revelation, Jesus told Peter, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And so Peter begins to loose the prophecy of Isaiah 53. With his stripes, you are healed. It declared by faith, you are healed first and foremost. And then all of a sudden, the word was made flesh, and it says, ye were healed. God will heal you. I'm standing in front of you right now, and I'm not magnifying my, my pain condition, but I, I refuse to be quiet about the word. I'm going mag- to talk more about healing than the pain that's in my body. I'm going to talk more about the word than the way I'm feeling. I will magnify his word Above my name. I can list you my symptoms right now. I can list you my wife's symptoms right now. Every day, we're both in pain. It's very frustrating. Part of it's life. Part of it's getting old. But part of it is, you know, God has a promise that's right there in front of you that you can reach out to. And so I am determined until I have the last breath in my lungs, I will declare the word of the Lord. Because God is true. God is true, and his word will not return void. I, I, I'm tired. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's been just the past, I, I don't know if it's weeks, maybe even a couple months. But it's just I'm tired of hearing so much about the devil, and I'm tired of hearing so much about symptoms and all that stuff. The Bible says Abraham, against hope, believed in hope in Romans chapter 4, and he refused to stagger at the promises of God. And the Bible says he considered not his own body dead. He was past age to have kids. And he says, I'm not going to look at my condition. I'm going to look at the covenant that was made between me and God. God made me a promise, and it shall be as he decreed. If God made you a promise, you have to declare the decree, and you got to speak the word. If you are fighting depression, if you are fighting addiction, you in just a second, I'm going to open the front of this area for you to come forward, and you got to begin to declare the promises of God. The Bible says, with his stripes I'm healed. The Bible says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the living God. The Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against it. The Bible says, no weapon that is formed against you is going to prosper. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So when you come to this front and you pray, if you want to be set free from nicotine, God will do it today. If you need to be set free from prescription pills that you're addicted to, God can set you free today. If you are depressed and you have suicidal thoughts, you can come to the front of this room today. You can lift your hands. You can lift your voice. And we can speak the promise of God's word over you. And he can set you free. God set my parents free from cocaine. God set my parents free from alcohol. God set me free. God delivered me. God will deliver you. God has done it for many people in this room. If you need a miracle, I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward. If nobody comes forward, nobody comes forward. But I, I am, I'm just dead set. I feel like I've preached more on healing 
this past year than I've had in quite some time. And sometimes it seems like as if nothing happens. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting discouraged. And I refuse, I refuse to give in to the attitude that God is a liar. God is not a liar. I said God is not a liar. I don't understand his ways. They're not my ways. I don't understand his thoughts. They're not my thoughts. They're past finding out. My pastor, who was dying of cancer, he went around laying hands on people that were sick and had cancer. They were healed, and he died of cancer. I don't understand that. But I'm thankful that my pastor exhibited faith regardless of outcome externally in his body. I'll never forget growing up in that city church of Harvey, Illinois, and there was a man that was a quadriplegic or a paraplegic in his wheelchair, and he was blind. He was in an explosion. He was a licensed minister of the gospel, sitting on a job site, and there was an explosion. A detonation went off, and the person right next to him completely disintegrated, but he was thrown by the blast and survived. It sounds like a miracle that he survived, except that he lost his sight, he lost his walking, and he never had his sight return. He never could walk in every day of his life. He was in pain. Every day, severe pain. And he would come to church. I remember, we didn't have handicap accessibility in the church in the, inner, uh, the, the south side, Chicago and Harvey. But when they would bring him up in that wheelchair, it would take four people to pick. The, he's a big guy. It would take four of us to pick up that wheelchair and go up about 10 to 12 steps to bring him in the house of God. Every single service that this blind man that was a, para, or a paraplegic and he was in immense pain every single time, he always held on to his Bible. And one day someone asked him, they're like, they're like My Brother Favel, why do you bring your Bible to church when you can't read it? He says, you never know. What can happen in an apostolic church? And when it happens, I want to open my Bible, and I want to see the Word of God came to pass. You just never know what can happen in an apostolic church. I shared this story years ago, but man, we've had some mighty waves of the Holy Ghost, and he came forward in his wheelchair. There was this high-level octane faith in the room, and Brother Favel was swaying back and forth in his chair, holding on to his Bible. Then all of a sudden, when faith re reached a crescendo, he lunged out of his wheelchair, and he fell flat on his face. And he died blind, never walking. But he died never complaining. He would talk about, he thanks God. Because we'd ask, what, what can you see, Brother Favel? He says, just this odd shade of like this off green. He says, but I thank God I could see that shade of green. If you need a little perspective about how bad you got it and how good God is, and just realize I'm still, I'm still in the presence of the king who's forgiven me of my iniquities. And he never saw his kids grow up from a small age, but he heard them grow up. And he heard that they married into the ministry. And another one became a pastor. And another one became an, uh, uh, an evangelist. Another one you know, wrote books. And, and this man was able to maintain his integrity and faith in the forever settled word of God. I don't know what God's going to do for you right now. But I know God can do it. I know God can do it. And if you need a miracle in your life. I want you to get as a little closer, as close as you can, just so you let people behind you come closer. If you need a physical healing, God can heal your body. If you need to be delivered from substance abuse, God can do it right now. If you need to be set free from some sort of wickedness, some sort of sin that you'd like to be set free, God can do it right now. If you need to be set free, God's going to do it in the name of Jesus. I believe it, therefore I speak it. So I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to lift up the name of Jesus higher than your doubt. I want you to lift your praises higher than fear, higher than anxiety. I want you to lift the word of God in the name of God above every 
doubt that is up against you right now. You may have been fighting this same fight since you were 12 years old, but in the name of Jesus, I want you to lift up his name right now. Not by my might and not by my power, but by the spirit of the living God. I am going to believe right now that God's word is going to be true. It's not going to come back void. It's not going to come back empty, but it's going to accomplish what it's set out to do. Lord, I pray for every sickness that is in this room right now. Lord, I can heal nobody. Of my own self, I can do nothing. But God, I believe where the word of a king is, there is power. Jesus, you are the king and you are here. So I declare the truth of your word right now with your stripes. Lord, we are healed. Come on, claim that promise. Begin to pray that right